<laughs> well, thank you guys. Thanks for being part of this uh, post-debate panel. So uh, what we're going to do here is just spend a little time getting your thoughts and reactions uh, to the debate. We've got our, our Facebook uh, audience who's posting questions to me now on this tablet. We'll answer some of those. But why don't I just go down the line here. You can each introduce yourselves. Uh, Wenren, why don't, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I'm now a adjunct professor at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at UBC. I spent 24 years teaching with my tenure at the University of Alberta as a China expert political science background. So I observe the China's rise uh, closely. I'm still affiliated with the Woodrow Wilson Center at the Global Fellow. So it's a very interesting debate today. Mm. Great. Jillian, you've come up to New York to be part of the debate, representing uh, the opinion group at the Wall Street Journal. So tell us a little bit more about your interest in this subject. Yeah, so I uh, spent a year in China covering religious freedom and religious persecution back in 2013. It's staggering to me to see how much it's changed since then. Um, but in addition to that, uh, right out of college, I was based in Hong Kong for the Wall Street Journal. So I've certainly seen the deterioration of freedom there too. Great. Janice Stein. Well, I'm the founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. So I've always taken great interest in the Monk debates and doing some work now actually on 5G and Huawei because Canada is at the epicenter of that debate right now. So Janice, let me start with you. What, uh, was there a moment in the debate, uh, something that popped out for you as a really key insight to take away from this evening? You know, I was really struck, Roger, how, how hard it was for all the debaters to answer your question. What do you do when the elephants fight or make love, but the grass dies? Mm -hmm. That was Keyshore's mm -hmm. great analogy. But small powers are having a really difficult time at this moment. Canada, more so than anybody else, we live next door to the United States, and we are in the line of sight right now of China, who is furious about the arrest of Meng Wanzhou. So to figure out how you navigate that world is just extraordinarily difficult. They couldn't, they couldn't actually hmm. give any good options to smaller countries to insulate themselves from this fight mm -hmm. that is rapidly escalating. Jillian, let's go to a, a question from Michael Wood who's been watching on Facebook. It's kind of up your alley, having uh, lived in China, having uh, exposure there in your time in Hong Kong. Do you think this type of debate could happen in mainland China today? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, one of the things I'm concerned about, so I think the analogy that kicked this debate off was don't skate where the hockey puck is, skate where it's going. Um, my grandfather's actually from Winnipeg. He's got a broken nose, and that attests to how hockey can sometimes be a blood sport. Um, Chinese politics, though, is even more of a blood sport. And I'm really concerned about where this hockey puck is going. Um, if you see not only the deterioration of human rights in China, but the way that they're exporting that to the rest of the world. You know, Reuters had a brilliant report out um, about how they're, they're actually working with the Venezuelan government to come up with ID cards. That's essentially a social credit system. It links your ability to get food. It links your ability to get medicine. All of these things. And it's used to track people and their political affiliation and then crack down on them and, and harm them and their families. So I think that that's something that's deeply, deeply concerning, not just how you know, this debate wouldn't be possible in China, but because of China, how it's going to be possible in fewer parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Wenren, you're a longtime observer of both the Canada-Chinese relationship, but also the larger uh, perceptions and misperceptions of the West towards China. Do you think any of those were cleared up tonight? I mean, I, I had a feeling that at times we were collapsing back into some older stereotypes about uh, you know, authoritarian systems versus democratic systems. That, to me, kind of rings a bit of the Cold War or even World, World War II era. Did that surprise you? It's, uh, it's so interesting. But that is a Western emerging consensus that China being portrayed almost as if it were still in the 1960s and 70s. I could tell you, other than being a longtime observer, being a Canadian citizen more than being Chinese, but I was born in China. I'm the same generation of the four gentlemen debating on the stage. I could tell you what 1960s, 1970s, even 1980s China looked like. It's nothing like today. Uh, Kishore mentioned 130 million people going abroad. Are you kidding me they're going back? Uh, they, this is by far what shocked me more in today's debate. Good debaters, one dimension that's missing is what about the internal dynamics of Chinese society, of themselves, 
the debates not on surface, as Julian mentioned, to the foreigners it might be like a wall, but internally the debates on all issues are happening all the time, and people disagree, including on questions how China is going to deal with the United States, whether China, China is actually doing something uh, counter to the international order. Those debates are ongoing, mm -hmm. uh, except the party doesn't want to allow the official voice to be generated, but that doesn't mean the debate doesn't happen. It happens all the time. So the question for me on both sides, I think, missing pro and con is what about the choices of Chinese people themselves? We are telling the world here what's good for China. What, what are our standards about from the West? What's good for China? Chinese people have observed themselves. They seem to have put up on this. Mm. Oh, how about let Chinese decide themselves? When do they want to have the change necessary? We're talking a lot about domestic system, which is not really connected well on both sides. I think the defense, the, 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 the defense side did not say much about the internal Chinese mm -hmm. system to counter uh, the American debaters. I think that's a problem. Jess, let's c continue on this theme because it is an important one. You know, you are somebody who, as an international relations expert, tries purposely to move past some of these stereotypes to a richer, more nuanced understanding. I guess if I had a concern maybe about tonight's debate, and the final vote results that mirrored identically the results of the beginning is that, that opinion, <laughs> opinions have hardened. Yeah. In other words, we're now, the kind of train's left the station here. Do you, do you agree that this is a dangerous moment because people's views are very fixed? I, I think there's no question that attitudes have hardened and it's probably um, more so in Canada than other countries. Uh, I said as we were uh, coming on to the stage and the debaters were leaving and I said to Michael Pillsbury, um, you know, we need a way to talk because there are bruised feelings yes. in this country that, that are much deeper than we expected as a result of the very tough trade negotiations. Mm -hmm. And he kind of smiled uh, because it's very hard for Americans to understand they bruised Canada's feelings. There are bruised feelings in Canada um, because of China's ferocious reaction to Meng Wanzhou's arrest, the, the imprisonment of two Canadians. Canadians are frankly shocked. Uh, they're stunned. They're stunned that there are um, punitive actions with respect to agricultural exports. So you're right that you're seeing the hardening of opinion in this country with respect to both the United States and China. Mm -hmm. And as Wen Meng was saying, there's no conversation going on really. Mm -hmm. There's very tough negotiation around trade which isn't about trade, <laughs> it's about much more. It's about the whole basket of issues between China and the United States, and we're just a casualty of it. And that's what I felt in the mm. room tonight, Roger. Jillian, you know, Wall Street Journal really has its uh, finger on the pulse of American public opinion. Do you sense the same dynamic in, in the US, that, that these opinions are starting to become hardened, and maybe there's a danger here mm -hmm. uh, that we get backed into a preset view, opinion, and that it then becomes politically, let's say, hard for this president at midnight tonight to move off a kind of tough stance because that would be seen to be kind of walking back on uh, and walking against the direction of public opinion. Well, I do think that, to answer the question another way, I think that frustrations with some of China's bad behavior have been building for a long time. And we're starting to see more evidence of this, more of this being litigated in US courts, Department of Justice issuing indictments. I think my favorite one recently was the guy who stole a robotic arm to smuggle back to China. They found it in his briefcase and he's like, oh, what is this? Um, but you know, I, I, I do think that there's a, a bit of a polarization issue here. But I, I also think, you know, we saw so much of the debate tonight being who's the greater threat to international order, the United States or China? And I, I just don't see that as a fair question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think honestly, but part of- But that's Canadians thought. Mm -hmm. they, they're the ones who had to deal with managed trade sure. from free trade. They're the ones- I, I'm not a fan of the trade war, by <laughs> the way. <laughs> I yeah, do think that's that why it is a fair question outside of the United States or China. Sure. There's mm -hmm. huge collateral damage being done to smaller players as a result of the behavior so, of we're, both. We're, smi we're smiting our own farmers through this as yes. well. Yeah. But I, I do think part of what's risky right now about the situation is because China is not a democratic government. 
the Chinese Communist Party gets its legitimacy not from the will of the people. They've made a compromise. They've said economic success. That's what we promise you. That's how we derive our legitimacy. So if we're doing things that hurt their economy, I think they fall back oftentimes on nationalism. I saw it when I lived in China. I remember um, you know, some conflict in the sea and Uniqlo having to shut down for a day because of security risks, because of the anti-Japanese rhetoric. That was something that surprised me. I remember the local sushi restaurant having to shut down for the day. So I think that the risk here is that if we target China in a really effective way economically, even if it's for good reason, and even if they have been undermining the international order, I, I think we make them almost worse. Mm -hmm. It plays into their worse impulses. Yeah. Wenren, let's come uh, to a question uh, to you from Samuel Fanning in Ottawa, who, uh, a simple one, but an important one. How do you think Canada can influence China? We've just had news reports in the last 24 hours that literally the phone calls of our prime minister are no longer being uh, answered or replied to. This suggests, a, does this suggest a, a real breakdown in the relationship? And are there any levers that Canada can play vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China and reopening some form of dialogue? Well, um, I've talked to, um, good question, I've talked to a lot of parties recently uh, around the country, including Ottawa. Uh, I could tell you that it's not secret that both sides are in a frozen situation and there is no effective communication, if anything at all, that's going on. Mm -hmm. There's something regarding academic exchange and under off the radar screen, including a Canadian embassy put together a Canada-China LNG farm in Beijing, which is public at the end of March, uh, which uh, I was invited to go and monitor. Those things are still going on. But on the crisis point, on Meng Wanzhou, um, the two Michaels are being detained. The two uh, Canadians are on the death row uh, in the appealing process. Nothing is communicating. This is a very bad situation. My view, I wrote this in the Global Mail the day after Meng Wanzhou was arrested, is to warn that both sides need to calm down. China should wait, mm -hmm. wait for Canadians to communicate with evidence. Canada should not underestimate China's will to protect its core interests. In this case, the Chinese are not saying Canada does not have rule of law. They've studied us. They know our system. What they're saying is the entire uh, arrest and extradition process led by the Americans carried out by Canada is not legitimate. Mm -hmm. they, uh, uh, they refuse to acknowledge the legitimacy of this extradition arrest, which is exactly how a great power like the United States behave. When they say this is the way we behave, right. we think this is international law, we follow, we follow. Yeah. If on uh, international criminal justice, people hate the court, they cannot charge Americans. Americans say no. So the Chinese have not behaved differently from the Americans, but we are the ones suffering now. So I would say better to communicate in any way than not to communicate, because that's actually where we are. So one way to do this, and it's not rocket science, one way to do this is to send a distinguished private citizen, Canadian, who has good relationships with China. Several come to mind. Um, it's not officially authorized. Those conversations begin. They're back-channel conversations. If they succeed, the messages come back to Ottawa. If they don't succeed, there's plausible deniability, and Ottawa pays no cost. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually surprised that more of that is not happening now, because Wen Rangjing is absolutely right. It's frozen. There is no meaningful conversation. Mm -hmm. Right Jillian, one of the, uh, the issues in this debate, uh, again, just to stay on the Canadian piece, uh, is the extent to which maybe Canadians feel that mm -hmm. by having President Trump continue the tariffs on steel in the face of <laughs> the assault, in a sense, that were... And aluminum. And aluminum. <laughs> uh, you know, with dealing with this deteriorating Chinese relationship, it kind of seems as if our closest friend and neighbor is no longer <laughs> really acting like our closest friend and neighbor. Now, the Wall Street Journal is a paper that supports free trade. Uh, what is your take on this administration and why they can't see that, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna kinda have to be an ally to the United States on China because the relationship is that important. Why can't President Trump give us some slack on the other parts yeah. of the bilateral file? 
I mean, I, I'm asking that question myself. I think it's such a counterproductive policy. And when that struck me, I was actually interviewing a guy in the US who makes lockers. And one of his huge inputs for the lockers is aluminum. So his costs have gone up just an enormous amount. Um, the solution to this is that there's a tariff on uh, aluminum, but there's not a tariff on prefabricated aluminum locker parts from China. Mm. And so this American company is just getting walloped. Like they want to build in America. They want to do this policy mm. that supports American manufacturing. And because of these tariffs that are supposed to protect American manufacturing, it's giving a competitive advantage to Chinese locker makers. And I, I just think that we see a lot of that playing out. I can't explain it. I wish more attention was paid to that. I, you know, I, I think that the solution to many of China's bad behaviors in the international sphere, particularly with trade, is getting countries to get on the US side. I, I think it was actually a catastrophe that we backed out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, because that's something that actually could have been useful. Mm -hmm. Can I just add on that topic? Um, on the aluminum and steel tires side, we're seeing, uh, if you look at the numbers, Americans are not lifting it. Uh, the fact that Chinese having the same um, uh, 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 tariffs, but the real exemption numbers, when you, when you uh, have these tariffs imposed, both countries, Canada and China and others, can appeal to exempt from those tariffs. The latest number is that 40% of China steel through appeal by American importers gone through, only 3% of Canadians yeah. went through. 80% mm. of Chinese aluminum went through through the US appeal, exempted from tariffs, only 0.4% Canadian aluminum went through. There is a nationalist agenda, call it tech nationalism, economic nationalism. Basically, what they're saying is, if you're iron and steel, steel and aluminum importing into the United States incompatible, complementary to US economic interests, they get exempted. In this case, China. When the Canadian aluminum and steel will have much larger volume than the Chinese mm. went to the United States, if they're not compatible, not complementary, they're rejected. Yeah. This is actually a very bad development for Canada. Mm. We should actually have these facts uh, let the audience know. I want to go to another Facebook question from Peter Wu in Montreal, and it gets at a few points that were raised in this debate, Janice, which is, uh, his question is, wh uh, why did a country of 200 years of history think that it could or should shape the future of a country with 5,000 years of history? Do you, do you feel that that's a legitimate argument, this notion that China is this much older civilization, and that there's got to be some quid quo pro here, not on the basis of what they sins of omission or commission that they're committing today, but this idea that, hey, they've been around for a lot longer, and frankly, there were large swaths of human history where their society was much more advanced than the West. I, th I think Chinese history um, is extraordinarily important. Um, it's a rich culture with a very proud tradition, and I think a country like the United States, and even we, um, make mistakes when we don't accord China the respect, um, especially in a context where China experienced what it calls over and over again these 150 years of humiliation. So starting by according China the respect and dignity that it deserves, I think is exactly right. I agree with your questioner. But you can't stop there, Roger, because what's getting in the way right now frankly, our systematic violation of rules that we've agreed to, and that's that China's agreed to. Uh, if you look at what broke these talks apart in these last 72 hours, um, in the round of negotiations that took place in Beijing, China repeatedly withdrew agreement that it had made in principle, but when the drafting process was going on, to change some of its laws mm -hmm. so that the process would be more permanent mm -hmm. than the kinds of verbal assurances that they've been given. That's, those are issues of today. Um, so while respecting- But just on that point, because maybe get Jillian Wenring to, to reflect on this, I mean, you really are asking the Chinese Communist Party to give up their model of state-controlled corporations. And you can see no, all kinds of ways no, that I, that's, that's terrific for you know, American capitalism, American businesses, but 
you know, isn't that a kind of imperialism no, that, that, that says, hey, our system is better than yours, you have to adopt that's it? That's, I think, I a false way of putting it. I, I kind of think so, too. So I do agree that, like, the last 200 years have been a bit of an aberration. I think human freedom is a bit of an aberration. Mm -hmm. It's something that's incredibly fragile and can collapse at any moment. That doesn't mean because it's an aberration, it's a bad thing. And I think when we criticize the West, what we're often criticizing is the times that Western powers were hypocritical. That's a, a critique of behavior. It's not a critique of the underlying principle. And so much of what I see right now is East versus West being pitted against each other. I happen to think that the human rights, the principles that underpin that rare 200-year aberration are, in fact, universal, not culturally specific. And I think that if you look at the reform movement in China, the appetite for protest, even when it's cracked down on, I think that's a testament to that. All right, the anniversary of uh, Tiananmen just yeah. uh, recently. Um, Wenran, what's your view on this? Is, I, is there a I kind want of to add that the, um, the debate in the West, uh, including in China, is really still ongoing uh, on the next steps of how China can reform mm -hmm. and open up. To say that the Chinese has a consensus that all their state-owned enterprises are solid, yeah. are supported by the state, by support by the people is simply not true. Right. Many people think the state owned the price is not efficient. They're monopolies. And they they're need to be growing as part of the Chinese economy over the last several yes, years. Yes, their their share their share yes. on the uh, Chinese economy is actually strong. weakening and getting smaller mm. over time. And it's not this humongous party dominated monster is imposing on the rest of the world. That reform is ongoing. If you look at past forty years, which didn't come as much in the debate is how much China has structurally, internally changed from a totally closed economy to a semi-market economy, if not a total open one. I think the trajectory here is the issue is, can we give some breathing room for China to reform itself, to carry the reform-oriented debate out? I see the difference between General McMaster and Michael Fulsberry, in our perspectives, the general is more like this is existential for us versus them. They're the evil, they're the totalitarian. And I think Fulsberry, who is more thinking what we do in promoting China's reform oriented forces, he does see China has divides inside. And he's saying maybe the best way is to pressure China from outside the world. How do we do that? To, to, to support. Ultimately, I think the rest of the world, especially in the West, we need to realize we're not going to change China. The Chinese themselves will eventually change China. But you see, I think there's a problem there right now yeah. because Michael Pillsbury is the hawk right now in Washington on the trade negotiations with China, more so actually than either Lighthizer or the Secretary of the Treasury. And why is that? And so that's where I don't agree with your question, right? So if in fact the rules of the game are when you go as a foreign investor in China, but in order, first of all, for years until very recently, you could only be a minority shareholder in a company. And secondly, there was no question that there were requirements for technology transfer mm -hmm. that were not reciprocated when Chinese come and invest in the United States or Canada. A part of this is not telling China what to do. A part of this conversation and is, if we're going to do this together, there has to be a level playing field. There has to be reciprocity. The most stunning conversations I've had, and that's why this debate is so much more complicated, stunning conversations are with private sector, Chinese business people. This goes to your point that the debate is ongoing in China. Who say, when you think about this, it's stunning, we are counting on Donald Trump to continue to pressure our leadership because that's the only way we're going to reform the economy and reduce the, the size of the state-owned enterprises in the economy. We can't do it on our own right. from inside the economy. And I'll add to you, I mean, we've talked about elephants tonight. I think the Chinese people know more about horny and boring elephants than many <laughs> because it's their own Chinese government. Uh, if we're talking about imposing Chinese 
order or Chinese priorities on the liberal international order, it's not necessarily the agenda of the people. It's not necessarily what benefits the people. It's often what benefits that one percent that has power of the Communist Party. But there also and I think pride in the Chinese government. That I think that's true, something I, we miss really. But I also think when there is, I mean, China's cutting down on the internet. They're cracking down on it. But in the cases where we have seen cases of corruption, everything from the Bloomberg investigation into finances to the kid that ended up the cadre's son in the Ferrari, that horrific car accident in Beijing. I think there is dissatisfaction. It's just whether the Chinese people are going to be able to express but that in a way you that say, changes. Wouldn't you say, Jill, it's, it's a much more nuanced conversation in China. So yes, there is an abhorrence of corruption, um, as there is in, in many countries that are, that are not well governed. But at the same time, there is enormous pride that people feel in what China has accomplished and admiration for the government that's taken them on this journey for the last 20 or 30 years. So we have to be very careful. Um, Chinese, you know, that Chinese capital C, capital P, don't think alike. They're nuanced in their opinions. They're divided. There are debates about reform. Um, and that's why it isn't appropriate for us to get, I don't agree. It isn't appropriate for, for us to direct that debate. That's a Chinese debate. What is fair is that we have fair and reciprocal rules mm -hmm. for trade and investment. That's a reasonable request. That's not imperialism. Mm -hmm. That's just a reasonable fair request. Wen Ren, I'm going to give you the last word. Yeah. I, I, I would say that uh, at the moment, the Western emerging consensus we can see from pool number, even Canadians, are going to see China as a major threat. The, the idea that um, China, we allow China to open up, we help them, they got rich. We expect them to be like us. 40 years later, they're not like us. No. And we blame on the Chinese. Instead of blaming on our own misperceptions about where China goes, we are projecting in the beginning what's good for China. And now, this is China is not doing good and we need to do something about it. I think that's the trend. This is dangerous because the prescription is to contain China and to push back instead of continuing to have the dialogue and encouraging China's reform-minded forces uh, to move forward to reform China through Chinese themselves. I think that is the problem. We, we, we turn around instead of blaming ourselves with the wrong expectations we had over the years, we said the Chinese are not living up to our expectations, and now we'd better do something about it. I think that perception is dangerous, and it's not going to lead to good out policy output. We have to look at the internal dynamics about China. It's more complex, and work from there. I, I think that is probably should be the taken away from the debate, no matter which side is saying what. You know? right. yeah. Richard, have yeah. we ever had a draw in the debate? Uh, this is the <laughs> second time only in 11 years this yes. that we've had time. a, a quote, technical draw. So yeah. It yeah, shows you how complex these issues yeah. are and yeah. how important. And maybe right. the optimistic side of it is that maybe people's minds, they might be made up, but there could also be a flip, right? There could yeah. be that potential for people to rethink this at a later date. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming for on sure. after the debate to help us think about what happened over the last uh, hour and 40 minutes. Janice Stein, Jillian. Thank you, Thanks again. And I'll just say uh, yeah. goodbye to our friends watching on Facebook. <laughs> Thanks for being part of uh, the Monk Debates. We're going to do this all again in the autumn for our second annual debate of 2019. Thanks for tuning in. Like us, friend us. We'll see you around. Bye-bye. Thank you.